Hi everyone, my name is PK and here I have Sud Setia. He is a program manager in Melbourne. That's what he does professionally, but he's just bought four properties in six months. He's made, I think it's like over 250 or I think actually $280,000 of equity in just those six months. He's a, well, I am very proud to call him a, a client of the Property Investment Accelerator. And in this episode, We're actually going to be lifting up the hood or the bonnet, so to speak, understanding what he bought, where he bought, why he bought there. And he is very like amazing community member in my Facebook group. And he posted his deals there yesterday. And we have about half a dozen questions from the community around what entities he bought in, how he managed to get the borrowing capacity to buy so many properties, why he bought them you know, so quickly, like what was the rush? So many questions that you have I'll be asking so that hopefully you all can take this as inspiration and education and emulate his success. So stick around right till the end. This is not going to be an ordinary interview. But without further ado, um, thank you so much, Sud, for, um, for just being you, for having your vision, for having your motivation and for uh, yeah achieving some fantastic success. Thank you for having me, PK. Um, all right. Well, let's let's get going. I know that your property investment journey didn't just start in the last six months. Um, so if we rewind, where did your property journey start in Australia? So PK, last year has been fantastic for us, as you know, and we've been able to grow our portfolio from $2 million to $4.5 million. And that two eighty thousand equity that we have acquired in just the last six months have been fantastic. Um, that was only possible due to a huge mindset shift for us. Now we started our original journey in 2011 mm -hmm. and we bought properties overseas. Uh, our first property was in 2011. The second one was in 2014. And the first property in Australia was actually in 2017. That started in Frankston South here in Victoria. We were rent resting at the time in the city. We didn't want to change our lifestyle. So we bought in Frankston South, a really nice property in the Frankston high, high school zone. And back in the day, there did not used to be so many tools. So I don't know whether you remember, there used to be in real estate, this uh, map that used to show you like deep reds and the lighter reds. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Ripple effect potential and all of that. Yeah. And then we would call the agents, try to find, once we narrowed down the suburb, it, the next step was to then find the right streets uh, where the school zone is and, and then find the property, right? So we, we bought our first one at an auction actually were very, very nervous, had never bought in an auction before. And we just had the number. We knew that this is the number that we don't want to cross. And we were bidding against owner occupiers and families who wanted to buy to live in. So that was our first one. In 2018, we bought our PPOR in Cheltenham. That's in Southeast Victoria as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a huge renovation project because there was a lot of potential to add value. In this property, it was a fairly old property, 1950s built, and we renovated everything, the kitchen, the bathroom, new carpets, new tiles, um, new heating and cooling, paint inside out. And uh, we added value. I believe at the time we got an equity about, of about $100,000 straight away by putting in $50,000 um, worth of renovations. Right. So, so that was our second one. And... Then we started um, our journey of having kids and sort of life happened. And in 2021, we renovated, we got an opportunity to renovate our, our Frankston South property. So that's uh, that was a great opportunity because the tenants were leaving. We converted a 3-1 to a 3-2. And then from 2021 to 2023, we were waiting for Victoria to go down in value and mm -hmm. buy at the right time. Mm -hmm which I don't think ever happened. Okay. And the yields were not great. So that's when we came across your course. And from 2023, after doing your course, we bought our first one in October, 2023. We settled in December. And then the journey, I think you already know about the rest of the journey. 
Right, right. And so what prompted you, um, just quickly, what prompted you to do the course? Because by this time, you'd already bought two properties, one to live in, uh, one uh, in Frankston. Uh, as an investment property, you'd done a couple of renovations. So like you weren't super new. Uh, what sort of attracted you towards the, the course and the education and the mentoring? So what we wanted to learn, PK, was how to buy interstate. Like when I came across your videos, there was a light bulb moment. Why am I just looking at Victoria? Why am I not investing in these interstate locations where the yield is so high? And these are high growth areas growing rapidly, not like Victoria, which is having a, a dull period or, or that cyclical movement. Mm -hmm. And we were pretty sure that this is the right thing to do, but we were not sure how. Like, how do I buy interstate sitting here? So that's why we did the course. Right, right. Makes sense. Um, and so I, I just want to rattle off your, your properties real quick, and then we can ask some targeted questions. So the first one in WA um, was settled in December 2023. It's a 422 on 602 square meters. Its purchase price was 590. And the most recent valuation is 720. So that's about 130K in five months. Um, your second property through the course was in January 23, 422 on 867 um, square meters of land. It's got side access with granny flat potential, ability to renovate, purchase price 491. So it's under 500K. Recent valuation is 598, which is great. $107,000 of equity in four months. The third property is regional Queensland, settled in April this year, 2024. 422 again, 804 square meters. You like large blocks of land, I can see. Once again, granny flat potential, purchase price 540, recent valuation 580, 40K in one month. And the most recent one um, is once again, regional Queensland settling in July um, 2024. All right, so it's not quite settled yet. 422, 600 square meters of land um, with once again, a lot of upside potential, purchase price 571 and the rental appraisal is 680. So when someone hears, like when, when folks are probably watching or listening to this, they're like, oh damn, like that's, that's some great work, you know, amazing properties, amazing yields, amazing equity. Um, just to kind of break it down, where did you get, like, was it through just savings um, that you were able to fund all of the deposits and the capital uh, for all these properties? Or did you use equity from one of your existing properties? Uh, it was majorly through the savings. I haven't extracted equity actually uh, yet. Mm -hmm. I want to, and we want to keep going. But uh, we had some cash waiting to invest in Victoria, which is what we invested in to state. Right, right. Um, and obviously, like, and once again, this might be a bit of a personal question, so you don't have to answer it ex like explicitly, but there's a lot of um, equity in these, obviously, but there's also a, a certain amount of borrowing capacity that, that you would have required to buy these. Um, is it fair to say that you're on a pretty good incomes? Are you on joint incomes or how did you service all this debt? So, so we, are, we are on pretty good income, but we are not over 200K each or anything like that. Right, right. And, and I, I want to also ask, like, you know, you've bought these properties so quickly. And this was one of the questions actually from the Facebook group member. How did you act so quickly and confidently in these markets? Um, and once again, if if you can answer with a, a view to trying to help folks who are watching or listening so they can try to do this as well. What, what are some key tips? How did you, yeah, how did you do this so fast? So I think the biggest thing for us was knowing our why our goal. We set that in stone. We write that every morning and we read that two times a day so that we don't forget our goal and we are able to take persistent action, which is the second uh, important step that has helped us in our journey, taking persistent action. So we were faced with a lot of challenges, but we did not give up. We kept going. Going with speed has also helped us. So like if a property comes up on the market, really calling the agent straight away on the same day and making an offer if we can. So that has helped secure properties as well. All these four deals were either off or pre-market. Right. And we were, we were able to build good relationships with those agents. 
Mm-hmm. These were some of these were not our first offers. We had put offers with those agents before, and that also helped us secure these deals. And and I think mindset, so solution focused mindset, would be probably the last one, because we when we get challenges, what our mind usually does, and that's what it did for us, was bring this negative thoughts that maybe you don't have to go so quick. Maybe you don't have to take that much borrowing. Maybe you're taking too much risk. So telling our mind and controlling our mind rather than our mind letting letting our mind control us was was really key as well. And that's what we still do. And that's what that's why we want to keep going. Yeah, I would say those those are the major ones. Right. right. It's really fascinating to me. If you don't mind, I'd I'd love to dive a bit deeper in, into your mindset. So you're saying that you actually write down your why like twice a day. Um, you're you're writing that down. Do you, do you sometimes, you know, in the process of buying these properties and I'm sure being rejected by agents, um, it's it's a quite about a lot of work as well, just in terms of paperwork to settle four properties, there's suburb selection to do, there's liaising with conveyances, property managers, and you're doing this all whilst working. You're both working, your yourself and your um your wife, and you've got, you know, you've got kids as well. Uh, you know, for people watching or listening, they might be like, well, mindset's great. Mindset is amazing, but like, where did you find the time to just do all of that? Or does that come down to mindset as well? Uh, I'm just trying to excavate like your thought process with your with your wife. Um, you know, how are you able to be so confident? Yeah, I think it it comes down to mindset as well. Uh, and it's about finding time to do the things that are the most important things for you. So the most important thing for us was to get financially free in 10 years. And the only way we can do that is by taking action today. So that's what we do. Most of our weekends, almost all of our weekends go into finding the properties or finding the suburbs, doing data analysis. We love it. Um, Listing down the name of the agents who we're going to call on Monday or Tuesday, finding time during work if we can, and I extend my work timings to make sure I make up for the lost time. So as far as I'm working 40 hours a week and getting the outcomes, that's what matters. Mm-hmm. And and then also after hours, I wake up first thing in the morning, five o'clock to start my day early and, and do focus blocks <clears throat> again to work on that real estate journey. And the most important thing also for us is that we enjoy it. Like we absolutely mm-hmm. love it. We are so passionate about real estate that all of this calling agents, building relationships, buying a property, finally securing something, that all excites us. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are challenges in, or there's an issue in the build and pass. What do we do? But we already know and are prepared in our head that that's part of the process. There's one thing that I've always learned. Happiness doesn't come after success it's actually happiness first and success later. And what I mean by that is back to the enjoying the journey bit is if we are not happy enjoying the journey, the success would be delayed. The success could take years because we're not performing at our best. But if we are happy, we are absolutely performing at our best potential. That's what I feel uh, for, for ourselves. And then the success just comes; it follows. Right, that's terrific advice. I just want to digest that and 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 really think about it because I feel that many investors may see property as just a vehicle for their why. Of course, the why is what they're passionate about, which is the case for you as well. But they're not so passionate, I guess, about property itself it's just a vehicle to achieve that why but you're actually passionate about property what advice would you give to someone who you know they like property you know they're dear DIYing it they're doing it but they're missing out on properties or you know when you know they'd rather be watching Netflix or hanging out with their kids all good things as well you know they're doing like suburb selection or they're calling agents and or they might be like 
uh, you know, like I've called four agents. That second one was super rude to me to hell with all of this property stuff, you know, like people who aren't enjoying the journey like you have, what are some tips that you can give them so that they too start enjoying the journey? They too start living in the present. They too start actually enjoying the process rather than trying to have, rather than having this mindset of like, let's just get this done with so I can retire. Because like, I feel that's a very transactionary, myopic, like artificial or superficial um, approach to life, but that might be the reality for people. So what advice can you give so people can also enjoy the process like you have? Well, the first question that um, I would ask myself if I was in their seat is, do I enjoy real estate? Am I passionate about real estate? Because if I'm not, I might not actually enjoy the process, right? So maybe it's not the right thing for me to invest in. Maybe it's something else. Oh, I love that. I love that answer. Yeah, I mean, we always have this, you know, people who are into property like me, we always have these debates with people who love stock market. And it's like, oh, property is better than stock, stocks are better than property. But I think that's that's some pretty uh, grave words from, from you. It's like, if you like stocks and you can make a better return leveraged versus property, then double down on what you enjoy. Because whatever you enjoy, you'll actually... Um, You'll be good at I remember my mom used to tell me, if you enjoy the food that you eat, then you'll digest it. But if you don't enjoy it and you're just having to eat it because someone's forcing it, then you won't digest it and therefore it won't be healthy either. So <laughs> it reminds me of that. So a, a similar sort of concept. Um, and I want to ask you as well in terms of buying into stay. Of course, that was the main reason you did the course. What were the key challenges in buying interstate, both over in WA and you're, you're in Victoria, you bought in Queensland? What were the, like, I don't know, the top one or two challenges of buying interstate and how did you overcome them? So I, I think the first challenge for us was forming a team. And one of the key learnings for us has also been don't spend time on petty things or non-important things. So have the 80-20 rule, what are those 20% things that will get you the 80% value? Like initially when I started, I was looking to negotiate the best PM fees. I was looking to find the best interest rate. These are non-important things. Getting into the market is, is the most important. That's what we have learned for ourselves. That That will give you so much capital growth like if I bought instead of December in August, I would have had another fifty, eighty thousand dollars of capital growth. Mm -hmm. It just gets you in early, and that's what's the most important thing is. So understand what are those biggest things. Finalizing suburb probably is understanding what area to invest within that suburb probably is. Talking to real estate agents is probably the number one as well to finally get the deal. So focus on those items. Right. Yeah. Pareto principle, 80, 20, keep the main thing, the main thing. I, I like that because I, I'm also guilty of it in, in different facets of life. You like you, you get really upset because the property manager sends you like, uh, I don't know, electricity or electrical wiring maintenance bill costs $300. And she's done that, you know, two months in a row, you're like, oh, that's 600 bucks. Oh, this property investing thing's not for me. It's like 600 bucks. It's it's nothing compared to like the 100,000 you've just made in the last year. But the, the mind is a monkey and you got to keep it under control. But even though you've done the 80-20 really well, what I love is that you've actually bought really solid properties. They're all solid brick um, homes. They're on quiet streets. They're in great suburbs, minimal. You see, these are your words, minimal public housing, you know, not many renters. They're really good owner-occupier pockets. In terms of like the entities or the structure are you buying these? Did you buy them all in your own name your, with your wife or were they in trusts or could you take us through that? Yeah, so we, the first three we bought were in our names because we had the borrowing capacity. But for someone who doesn't have their borrowing capacity like ourselves, I think what I would recommend is buying in trust from the first property. That's what we are doing for our fourth. So mm -hmm. when we knew that our borrowing capacity is going to be exhausted is when we started exploring trust. Right, right. And 
for those of you who aren't familiar um, with like, this concept of borrowing in, in your own name versus trust, and of course, none of this is financial advice, everyone's unique. Could you could you take us through the rationale a little bit about why you, you bought that last one in your trust and you're going forward in buying in trust? Yeah, so the reason to buy in trust were well, well, two, two key reasons. One is it's, it gives us asset protection. And the second is uh, it helps preserve our borrowing capacity. So if we are able to buy a high yielding asset in a trust that is self-sufficient in itself, like again, it's not financial advice, please talk to a broker and a good accountant to confirm that this is the right strategy for you. But this is what we understood. If we buy a property which is self-sufficient and can stay in, in that trust as an entity, so it's a corporate trustee, then we are able to buy another one in another trust if we wanted to, or in our personal name with the same borrowing capacity that we have got left now. Right, right. And for these four, three in your own name, one in a trust, what kind of LVR, like how much deposit were you putting um, for each of them? Like, are you putting, are these like really heavily geared? Are you going up to like 95% loan, only 5% deposit? Or is it like 20% deposit, 80% loan? And and what's your rationale? So 90% LVR for all four of them. Right. And so you paid, um, you know, if you put down a deposit, um, of kind of less than 20%, then you have to pay lenders mortgage insurance. So I take it you paid lenders or you're okay with lenders mortgage insurance. Could could you take us through the rationale for those of you, for those people watching, listening that may be a little bit like, oh, I'd rather save up and avoid lenders mortgage insurance and, and make that 20% deposit instead of just a 10% deposit. Um, why didn't you take that approach? So when we wanted to get first time in property investment in Australia in 2017, that's when we paid LMI back then. And the reason was that we had around $50,000 saved up that we wanted to use. So about 88% lending is what we got. Mm -hmm. And we bought a $628,000 property, but we wanted to get in, right? And we made money out of that property. So getting in is more important for the, these last four, I haven't. We haven't paid any LMI because we work for a bank. Oh, okay. So for us, LMI, 90% LVR, it doesn't, like the bank doesn't ask for an LMI if we are going 90%. Anything lower than that, yes, we'll have to. Got it. Makes sense. Well, you're lucky in that way. That's that's good for you. Um, do, do you know, do, do banks waive LMI even if buying in different trusts or is it only in your personal name? Even in the trust. Oh, okay. Right. So we, we've been fortunate that way. We've also been fortunate because uh, we had a fixed interest rate of 2% on our PPOR. Right, right. So that's helped too with the borrowing capacity. Gotcha. I assume at some point that fixed interest rate is going to jump up to 6 or 7% when the fixed period rolls over, assuming interest rates don't fall significantly anytime soon, which I don't think they're likely to do. In terms of your cash flows, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, you know, you've got six properties now, uh, these recent four plus your own one to live and your existing um, rental property. What's what's kind of like your overall cash flow position? I mean, I don't expect you to know it like down to the exact dollar, but, uh, you know, is it like tens of thousands of dollars that your, your, your portfolio is costing to hold um, and how are you dealing with that or is it better than that? So over the next couple of years, we would be about twenty thousand dollars a year that would we would be paying to hold these properties, mm -hmm. and then um, the forecast that I've got based on the interest rates is we'll go down to ten thousand, then five, and then from third year onwards we'll be positively geared. And this right. is the same thing we observed in our property that we bought in twenty seventeen as well. It was originally negatively geared, ten thousand dollars one property in Victoria. That's Victoria for you, and uh, it stayed like that for a couple of years. Victoria was flat, and then it became neutrally geared and then positively geared. Right. And so, what would you to say? What would you say to someone who is thinking, well? It doesn't make sense to invest in property because each of those properties is costing like four to five thousand dollars in negative gearing. Negative gearing is not a great thing. It means that it's costing me to hold. 
oh, property investing is is just not for me. Or let me wait to for interest rates to come down and that's when I'll get into the market. Why don't you do that? So as Warren Buffett says, buy when the fear is in the market, not, not when there is greed. I think he says something on those lines. Sure. But that's what we wanted to do. So the last thing we wanted to regret was we didn't go hard during COVID. We did not do something. We did not buy. That's what we regret as human beings, right? We don't, we don't regret doing something. We regret not doing something. And now when the interest rates are rising, there's news now, potentially there's another rise coming. We want to buy two more if we can during that time because there would be less competition. And when the interest rates finally come down, there would be greed in the market and everyone would want to buy. Everyone who's been holding off to buy would want to buy then. And that will further increase the prices and we'll have more equity. Right. Oh, equity. Well, well, well answered. Now that, that I would hate to think what happens when it, hopefully interest, I mean, I'm kind of going out on a limb and saying this, but I genuinely don't think interest rates should come down very quickly anytime soon because it would just, it would cook the housing market so much. Even right now, the, in May, I think the core logic stat was that national house prices grew by 0.8%. So if you annualize that, that's double digit growth. And that's with, you know, potential you know, interest rate rise lurking, although I don't think that's probably going to happen. We're probably just going to be at this level for a long time. But yeah, when interest rates do fall, definitely what you're saying is likely to happen, more demand in the market. Um, and I think people should also consider that, yes, you need to really assess your cash flows, whether you can afford to buy a property that costs you a few thousand dollars to hold every year. Everyone's different, so you need to do that math yourself. But even with interest rates not coming down, in a few years' time, like your experience with your initial Melbourne property, rents go up, and therefore that negative cash flow turns positive. And of course, right now with the rental shortage, I mean, the market rents are going up, right? So that is happening in a sort of, uh, at a higher velocity, that, that concept or phenomenon of negative gearing turning into positive gearing. And if you wait three years, then property price will be higher and you kind of would have missed the boat in, in, some, in some respects. So I think uh, everyone's different, but I like to deep dive into your mindset, which is awesome. And in this whole process, uh, so I know that your your wife has has really been a how would you say you guys have been partners in in this investing journey. How have you shared responsibility, or how have you, um, you know, have there been conversations over the dinner table on on how you're doing this? Is there been disagreements? What's that sort of dynamic life, uh, dynamic like between sort of husband, wife and doing this together? Absolutely. That's what that's what is the topic in our home all the time and has been for years. So when we got married in 2014, like since then, every time we have so, so much common interest and love for properties that every time we have seen an auction happening nearby, we'll just stop by an open home will just stop by and just look at the homes, talk to the agents, right? So I think the only thing that was missing was the mindset of building a portfolio and retiring early, which is now such important thing for us that that's what we talk about all the time. My five-year-old knows inside out what I'm working on all the time outside of work, that's property. And he looks at my screen and goes, are we buying this property? <laughs> I like this one. Let's buy this one. You know, and it's so much fun. And I really feel fortunate that we have started doing something like that. Like I wish I had this kind of financial education when I was growing up mm -hmm. because it would have put me in a different place altogether. Like our whole education system is flawed in the sense that it tells you that you got to earn money by giving your time but it doesn't tell you what you do with that money and how do you get that money to work for you. And that's where the real game is. And that's where we should all be spending our time. So it is a huge topic at our dinner table. And I wish we, but not only us, our kids are going to be able to be more successful uh, using these financial principles, not just in property, but diversifying their portfolios, et cetera. I love 
property, especially like it's real estate is something really close to my heart. I also love it because of the leverage that you can get like hundred thousand dollars. You convert that into 500 and then 500 is what's growing at 7% every year instead of putting hundred thousand dollars in an ETF, for an example, which is, which might still give you similar result, but that's hundred thousand growing rather than the 500. So right. you know, it's a huge topic for us. Yeah. Right. It's great. Great to hear the whole family's into it. I think we, I wasn't playing it. I think my wife was playing, it was like a kid's version of Monopoly with my son the other day. And he had like got a number of houses. And then, and then I think my wife just, act, we don't kind of talk about it that much over the dinner table or anything like that. But I think my wife let slip that, oh, we've actually, you know, we've got like in real life X men houses, like 12, 13, whatever. And he, his jaw just dropped. He was like, I don't think he understood it. He was like, I think he, was, he thought she was joking or something, but it's uh, I think you're probably doing better than than me at that. I think you're doing a terrific job of taking your kids along that journey. Financial education starts starts young um, and should start young uh, when the when the kids are ready. So so that's that's great job and and great job on doing that. And I think last question or last couple of questions. If we zoom right out, you know, let's say put yourself back in. 2017 or put yourself back at the start of COVID or pick a timeline before you had a larger portfolio. Let's say there are 10,000 people watching this episode, you know, on YouTube or Spotify or Facebook or whatever. And they're in that sort of situation you were in. They're like, okay, I have some equity. Maybe I'm in Sydney, Melbourne. I have some equity. I can't really afford Sydney, Melbourne. Um, I can't buy with these terrible yields locally either. I want to buy interstate, but there are th some things that are crippling me, you know, interest rates, will they rise again? Will they not? Recession, will we go into a recession? These things, they, for me, it seems like we talk about a recession coming for the last like 20 years, every year we Forever. talk about it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's so many hangups. It's like, what if I lose my job? property is too hard? What if tenants are, are difficult? How am I going to manage a place interstate? You know, I have, I'm going to get so much debt, you know, all these sort of fears that go through your mind. What's kind of like some advice that you can give someone like that? Um, some some well-measured um, education or advice that you can give them just to give them confidence that, you know, it will be all right and that you don't need to overthink. Thinking is good, but overthinking can be detrimental. What What's some words, words of wisdom that you can give to such people? So PK, what, what I've learned through what our parents have done as an example. So my dad, I remember bought a property for $20,000. I don't remember what year that was, but he sold that property in 2010 for $800,000. So the kind of growth that a property can give you can be really, really huge. Like we could be working on nine to fives forever and still not be able to make the same money, right? If you look at super as another example here in Australia, if you've got $125,000 super, let's say I'm talking about a 40 year old person who's got $125,000, that super by the time that person gets to 65 will grow to five seventy seven thousand dollars the same amount of money if was converted into an smsf invested in property five hundred thousand dollar property instead of the 125 growing would result in a 2.1 million dollar at the same age 65. so we need to understand what steps we need to take now to be able to achieve what we want when we retire also, do we want to retire at the age of 65 or do we want to retire early? So based on, again, it will go back to the why and to the goals. What are your goals? Are you happy with the life you're living and be beaten by inflation? Or are you ready to take action? So there's another analog analogy that I use as well, which is if you grow, if you plant roses, what happens? Roses grow, right? But if you don't do anything, if you don't take any action, what happens? Weeds grow. So in property sense, if you are investing in property now, what happens? That property grows, gives you, um, you know, a lot of return in a few years. But if you're not taking action now, what happens? You're being beaten by inflation and your money in the bank is eroding. Right. I mean, you can't, can't argue with that. Well, 
well said and and just to compliment that as well i always think it's not my quote i don't know who made it up but i always think that the door to success opens inwards and so to to really be successful you do have to kind of just step back let that door open yeah and then you can move forward and obviously that's metaphorical to suggest that much like yourself so you have to take a step backwards and you have to work on your mindset you have to go inside you have to go uh, from the external to the internal fix or replenish or improve the health of your internal environment your mindset your psyche your subconscious because a lot of the hurdle or a lot of the blockers in building wealth whether it's property or through any method or vehicle is simply the relationship we have with money and i think hearing you and all the things that you're saying your relationship with money is is very healthy in, in so far as it's there's no like greed there per se but there's a clear why in 10 years time i want financial freedom you have a family presumably you want to spend more time with them and you know you're enjoying the process because like you said i'm just repeating what you you said earlier if we're not in the present if we're not enjoying the present then when we achieve our goals we won't be in the present to achieve those and we'll always be chasing for something more and more so i think that's phenomenal advice coming from you and and i hope people can imbibe it and once again the door to success opens inwards you do have to work on yourself you know both your heart set your mindset before you can walk through and and really cook pick goals so look i just want to congratulate you um this episode was a lot about the mind a lot about i think it's the right hand side of the brain left is analytical if i'm not mistaken right is more creative i think it was a lot to do with the right hand side of the brain but i think that is equally if not actually more important strategy is great but without the right mindset strategy crumbles and it deteriorates or it never gets built in the first place so thank you so much um for for sharing your words of advice i know that you're not stopping you're going to continue buying what's your last question what's your 10 year plan in terms of um like do you have a a passive income goal do you have some sort of financial monetary goal that you have in mind Yeah so we we our own personal plan is to buy 10 properties uh and within the next 2 years so I have have a portfolio of 10 properties around I think we are at 4.5 million dollar now we want to get to around the 7 million dollar mark and then in 10 years sell five and have the five pay our rents or pay as passive income and should be around that 120000 is is what it comes to based on my calculation in my strategy and that's the plan for us but at the same time i want to help others take with me along this journey and help them build wealth through property investment now i wish i had someone who had done that for me 10 years back like i would be in such a better place now maybe even ready to retire or have the choice to not work if i did not want to and that's what we want for ourselves we want to spend more time in 10 years with our kids give them the opportunities that we believe we did not get in our lives take them travel and you know to different countries give them that exposure that is our why that's that's really nice to hear um and so maybe a cheeky question from me if anyone's on the fence about doing the course or not it is like i get it it's it's expensive uh, what would your advice be yeah i think i posted that on the on the facebook group as well pk we were sitting on a fence for some time if you are someone who loves real estate who wants to do it themselves who has got the time to do it themselves who wants to understand the game inside out do the course it's a no brainer we learned a lot from the course and especially if you're wanting to buy into state there's like golden nuggets in there that that we found that we were able to use in our journey also the community is great as well guys hope you got value and 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 a lot of gems from this i will tag sud on the facebook group so if you are inspired by his journey you can definitely hit him up he's a super nice guy he can give you some advice and try to guide you um but if if you did like this i just want to say as well everyone is watching or listening there's there's almost like 150 of these client interviews now on the client results playlist on youtube and i always say but i honestly don't mind if you do the course or not 
but please go through them because just like so it will help to inspire you and educate you so if you're kind of on the fence of taking action for yourself by yourself it might just push you over and you should go off and do it all right there's so much free education out there go off avail it and really get results and of course uh, i'm super helped Well, oh, super grateful to be able to help people like Sud as well in a more formal way through the Property Investment Accelerator. Hit the subscribe button, give it a like. And once again, thank you so much, Sud. Thank you, PK.